this idea that like, Somebody profits from a policy and it's not me. Therefore, I'm going to be like the lowest, most serpine person on the planet. Like newsflash, should I have to pay for elementary schools? I don't have a child. Should I have to pay for the roads? I don't have a car or a driver's license. Should I have to pay for Section 8 housing? I can pay rent. Should my taxes go to endless wars? I don't give a crap what the Ukrainians are up to. It's none of my business. Because actually, in, <laughs> in that argument, uh, if you go back as far as I do, the fact of the matter is what they teach now in college is what was taught to us in high school. So, and high school, of course, was free. Yeah. When you talk about a free college education, you're not really getting a college education. You're getting what in a previous generation was called a high school education. There are, believe it or not, you come from an elite background, you know, in education. Mm -hmm. There are many students who enter into college now who've never read a book. You know, I mean that literally. I teach in those schools. I don't fault them. They, I asked, what did you do in English class? They said, what did we do in English class? The teacher read us books. They just, the teacher read. Like it's third grade? Yeah. I mean, you can laugh, but that's literally the case. You will have many co- first-year college students who never wrote a paper. They don't know what it means to write a paper. Well, it's going to get worse with this chat GPT stuff, or at least so my boyfriend, an English teacher, tells me. Um, but it, it's just honestly... I I argue about a lot of things with people, obviously. Student debt is literally the only issue among all of Bernie's campaign issues that even like starts to a little bit affect me. Do you know what I mean? And every single thing that I've ever fought for is literally not about me. Like, I'm good, you know? I'm good under the status quo. And yet, like the fact that I have even a little bit of investment in this one thing makes people feel entitled to characterize my politics as self-interested because I can speak from like a position of knowing what it feels like personally to have six figure debt as a 25 year old person and can bring that kind of empathy to the experience that I can't quite frankly bring to let's say the universal health care fight. I mean, I can abstract, you know, but like I've always had healthcare, I've always been able to afford healthcare, even if like I was on expensive Cobra for a year, but it's, you know, it still could, I could technically pay for it. So like, it's just, it seems to me it's so callous, like it's so, it's so diminishing. I find it to be so immoral that I find myself getting really emotionally invested in fights about student debt in a way that I shouldn't. For pe- For people to take what should be a point of recognizing empathy from someone who was frankly a class trader and try to flip that into somehow evidence that the people she's advocating on behalf of don't deserve notice. I have limited emotional energy left to not just call people stupid to their face. I, I, I feel like I've been sp- spending the last five or six years of my life going out of my way in part because of who I am to decline from saying you are a fucking moron like 30 times a day. Brianna, I think I think fucking moron is a perfect segue to the topic today. All right, Norman Finkelstein, let's talk about these effing morons. <laughs> I am so glad to have you back on the podcast. You know you're one of my all-time favorite guests. I love having conversations with you because of the intellectual rigor that you bring to the conversations, the introspection, your ability to self-reflect and to constantly be challenging yourselves as yourself as hard as you challenge all of those that you engage with, including myself. And it really feels like you elevate the level of conversation. So thank you so much for joining me again here today. Well, thank you. You remain, in my opinion, by a wide margin, by a wide margin, best podcaster on the left. There's actually nobody even within, as we used to call it, hailing distance. Uh, You have a a solid foundation and you have a nimble mind. 
I, I, I appreciate you saying that. And especially given today's subject matter, for those of you who have not seen the news, when Ibram X. Kendi, who has been a professor at Boston University and the, uh, I, I would say, what would you say, uh, kind of a thought leader in the space of uh, anti-racism and some of the DEI style language that really burst into the mainstream in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement is in some hot water and uh, Basically, there was an internal investigation at BU that it seems was sparked by some inquiries from journalists about the program that he was put in charge of that was invested with millions of dollars that seemingly have been squandered and have um, resulted in very, very little in the way of addressing racism or pursuing any of the goals that it was supposed to actually achieve. So but how about we start um, by just talking a little bit about what's been going on with uh, uh, Ibram Kendi right off the bat. What are your impressions of the nature of the scandal top level? Uh, if I can just correct you on a number of small points, but sure. I might, might be mistaken. Uh, I followed it fairly closely and people have sent me information uh, the scandal began when between 15 and 20 of the 45 employees of the Center for Anti-Racism at Boston University, they were summarily fired. That's right. And at that point, several of the uh, people who were fired, but also those who were already uh, fired, came forward with their uh, scathing criticisms of the mismanagement of the center, the concentration of all power in Ibram X. Candy's hands, and the misuse of funds, uh, in particular promises that were made to undertake certain projects that was the contingency for getting the money, uh, those projects never having been uh, never having been pursued. And then at that point, when the articles started to appear, mostly in right-wing periodicals at the beginning, uh, when the articles started to appear, uh, then Boston University said, it will carry on an investigation. So today, there hasn't been an investigation. My own thoughts on the topic are, I think one has to separate out two things. Number one, the administrative aspect of the unfolding scandal. And then there is the intellectual aspect of which there's been pretty much nothing said. So there are many criticisms being voiced about Kennedy's um, management of this center. There has been criticism of the fact that there was no financial oversight uh, Candy pretty much was taking in not millions, but factually tens of millions of dollars. You hear various estimates between 44 and 55, 43 and 55 million dollars were taken in. It started with Jack Dorsey, the uh, mm -hmm. former CEO of Twitter, who donated 10 million dollars. Then the Rockefeller Foundation came in, and then it started to just pour in, you know, the expression, nothing succeeds like su success, hmm. money started to pour in. Uh, there was apparently no oversight. I have been in correspondence over the past couple of years with some of the people who stepped forward. And uh, they indicated to me that through various ruses and maneuvers, there was no income tax uh, supervision. How they did it, I don't know, but I'm just telling hmm. Been informed. So that's one aspect. And there, um, we're really at the beginning of the process because I suspect an audit is going to show uh, that we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. Uh, about the, uh, They say that they have an endowment still of 17 million, but that would mean about 20, uh, 30 million have disappeared uh, with very little to show for it. 
Uh, but then there's the second aspect, and the second aspect is that Kendi is still being acclaimed as an important scholar, an important thinker. Nobody wants to touch that third rail that, and I have to be careful here, not because of fear of libel, but fear of a conversation degenerating. In my opinion, he's just a huckster and a charlatan. There is no scholarship there. There's just zero. Uh, and then the question is, and it's a question for, I think, African-Americans in particular, but the left in general. You know and I know there are a lot African-American studies is a very serious discipline now. When it started out in the 1960s, it was not. This was universities just throwing bones. You know, women's studies, Latino studies, African-American studies, they were completely unserious. I know because I took the first courses. I, I was the only white folk fellow who, in my freshman year in college, I was determined to break out of my parochial Jewish ghetto growing up. And I took the African-American studies courses. And they were wholly unserious. They were basically bitching sessions. And you can get, sort of understand it, because at that point, it was not rich kids, black kids going to these schools. They were taking kids out of the ghetto and bringing them into university for which they were wholly unprepared and felt wholly unwelcome. So the classes were mostly bitching sessions and they were very unhappy with the fact that I was in the class. I was the only, it would be a class of 40. I would be the only white person. And I'll tell you, I'll, you know, I'll speak candidly. I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of. Every Tuesday and Thursday morning, I would break into a cold sweat whether to go to the class. I was struggling between my determination to break out of my ghetto and the fact that I wasn't wanted, I knew I wasn't wanted, and maybe they had a point. It's like a man coming at that point in time, we also had consciousness raising. I don't know if you know anything about that. But at the beginning of the women's movement, one of the uh, innovations, what was called consciousness raising sessions, when women sat around and talked about all their complaints about men. And it would be like a man forcing himself on a woman's consciousness raising session. It was obviously only for women. And I knew I wasn't wanted, and I was very conflicted about it. So back then, the field was not serious, but it has clearly evolved into a very serious discipline, which produces very high quality scholarship. And then you ask yourself, why wasn't a center given to Barbara Fields? Why wasn't it given to an Adolf Reed? If you want young, fresh blood, why not give it to Torrey Reed or a large number of other people, some of whom you've had on your program? Why was it given to Ibram X. Kendi? He had no academic, serious academic background. He went to Florida uh, A&M, the HCBU, H, excuse me, HBCU. Then he went to Temple University and he studied with this lunatic named Malefe Asante, I don't know if you know that name. It was a poppy. Yeah, you see, this is all old, you know, this is all ancient history for you. There was a whole field called Afrocentrism in the 1970s and 80s. And one of the leading Afrocentrics was a fellow named Malefe Asante. And he got this program at Temple University. And uh, Kennedy got his degree there. It's complete lunacy. But you know, these universities, they don't want to get in the bad side of the African-American community in Philadelphia. So they have this program. That's where he got his degree. Did he write anything of any significance? Okay, he wrote Stamped from the Beginning. It's a completely preposterous book, completely empty-headed. And I'm not trying to look. I've been discriminated against quite a lot in my adult life because 
my books don't get published by important publishers and blah, 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 blah. Although some have, in general, no. But the fact of the matter is, the book was published by The Nation magazine, their book off, um, their book adjunct called Nation Books. That's not considered a serious publisher. How did it win the National Book Award? It's completely illiterate. And then, out of nowhere, he gets appointed to run the center, and he's got tens of millions of dollars and no accountability whatsoever. What does that tell you? Not about the administrative side, but I'm talking about the academic side that a complete hustler and charlatan. If you look at his resume, he says he's written 15 books. 15 books. You know what the 15 books are? He wrote one book and 14 spin-offs. How to be an anti-racist baby. How to be an anti-racist doorknob. How to be an anti-racist scissor. Completely. And he calls these books. And now he's the author of 15 books. And to me, the most revealing fact is two things. One, why do all these woke liberals give him the money? There were so many talented African-American scholars of various age cohorts who they could have given the money to. And number two, why was he never questioned about even his scholarship? He has refused to be, to be, refused to debate anybody, has refused to answer any of his critics. Um, no accountability, no academic accountability, no financial accountability. And he's wildly, wildly promoted by all the woke precincts. Who publishes him? Jeffrey Goldberg. Jeffrey Goldberg, you know, who also promoted Ta-Nehisi Ta mm -hmm. and At the Atlantic. At, at the Atlantic Magazine, the editor of the Atlantic Magazine. No, I don't want to get off track, but it's a very revealing fact that the most woke precincts, the Atlantic Magazine, the New Yorker Magazine, the New York Times, are also the most fanatical promoters of the Ukraine war and uh, that sort of stuff. And yet, they love people like Kendi. And it's a, you know, it's a real question to ask. Why are these extremely conservative, and you can even call them right-wing woke people, they are so enamored of people like Kendi? And to me, the answer is pretty straightforward. A, he's stupid. And they like stupid people. They like stupid people because it's easier to control them. Uh, he knows, Kendi knows he's in over his debt. That's why he doesn't want to debate anybody. It would be completely humiliating. I'm not here to sing your praises, but you have the foundation, the academic foundation, you have a nimble mind, you're not afraid to debate anybody. You like the challenge. You like the intellectual challenge. He doesn't want to debate because he's no, he knows he's way out of his depth. So they like him because he's stupid. They like him because he's absolutely harmless, absolutely innocuous, doesn't threaten the system, doesn't threaten power, uh, and he's easily manipulated because he knows that if, um, if he loses them, you know, the show is over. He wouldn't even be able to teach in a community college in the backwoods in Alabama. He's not, he's not a, a very bright guy. So he's totally um, enthralled to them. Uh, so for me, the question has always, in my, the, to my mind, and this was my belief when it came to people like Alan Dershowitz or Daniel Jonah Gohagen from another era, the issue is not 
the person. The issue is who created him and why they created him. Who created him and why? That to me is the real issue. Okay, so let's let's get into some of that. I do want to go back and just address a couple of things you said early on. And we don't have to stay on these. I just want to articulate that I have a difference of opinion with you about some of these small things, and then we can move forward. I just want to be clear that I don't think that the issue is that he is insufficiently credentialized. I have a lot of respect for FAMU and the, the institutions that he went to I don't think are an issue at all. I think that he is eminently qualified in terms of his academic background to teach, to be a professor anywhere. I would center my concerns really solely on the quality of the scholarship as opposed to his academic background per se. And I also feel, even though I was not ever an African-American history major, nor do I think I took any AFAM classes when I was in college. I was a double major and didn't have any, any time for many electives. Um, I have been in dialogue often with my parents, especially my mom, both of whom went to an HBCU, met and, at Howard and graduated from the same. And my mother talks often about um, how rich her historical education was in particular in terms of of the reading list. Now, she did say that because her father was a Black Panther, she had read most of the books before she got to college, but that the scholarship, what they were asked to uh, interrogate, whether it's uh, Richard Wright or Franz Fanon or W.E.B. Du Bois, what have you, I, do, I think that she would likely, and others who have gone through an African-American history course at some of these institutions might push back on your characterization of them as empty. Now, this could be a temporal issue. She was going to college in the early 80s. Um, Kendi uh, is, I think, a couple years older than I am. He was, I think he's born in 1982. So he was in college in a very different time than either you or or my mother. But I just, I, I do feel like I have to- I, I'm glad you look- To say something in defense of what I think is the integrity of African American history yeah, as it's taught broadly. I, yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you said those things because it enables me to cl uh, clarify on the program rather than have to face the backlash. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, on the first question, I was talking about credentialing in terms of how you normally get a job in academia. Now, they look at for better or for worse. And I said, I was penalized by it. They look at who the publisher was. If you're an academic, and God be with you, you're not. If you're an academic and you say I published a book, what is the first question another academic asks? The very first question, who published it? That's the only question they'll ask. They won't ask you mm -hmm. the content. They won't ask you the thesis. They won't ask you anything. Who's publishing it? There is a real pecking order in academia. And secondly, it will follow you from the day you graduate to your grave. The day you graduate to your grave, where did you get your degree? I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but you know very well, when you're a lawyer, the first question you say, where did you go to law school? Sure, so, but it's it's also I mean it, I'm not of course saying, it's also true that there are so many very successful lawyers who did not, not go to T fourteen schools right, and who I'm, are, not, I'm I'm not denying that. I'm just saying it was a very odd thing that Kenny was wildly catapulted into so this opposition. Uh, now let me just get to that second okay. comment you made. Um it was a very the African-American history had a very venerable pedigree in the HBCUs, because you have to remember back then, people like the boys couldn't teach at a white university. He went to Atlanta. That's where he did most of his solid scholarship before he went to work for the crisis, you know, as the editor. So in that, in that grouping, yes, there was very solid look. All of them really top-notch scholars, people like E. Franklin Frazier, then <clears throat> uh, a bewilderingly, bewilderingly uh, talented person 
Ralph Bunch. You know, Bunch got a very bad rep in the 60s because he became very conservative. But Bunch, Frazier, they all were in the orbit of W.E.B., the boys. What I was talking about was because of the student movement in the 60s and the Black Power movement in particular, these departments were created out of thin air. There was no foundation. I'm talking about white universities. There was no foundation laid. So for the first few years, they were basically, as I said, they were a bone that was thrown in order to calm down the insurrection. But, but then- the norm, they, that just seems like an argument. I, I really don't want to get sidelined on this. So I don't, I ultimately, I don't really care. But I, I think there was, you're talking about inventing an entire new discipline out of whole cloth. Me, I would extend some grace to people in having some years where they invent a discipline out of whole cloth. I, I never, I never did so that. I, I don't, I yeah. don't quite understand the utility in an environment when a prospective president of the United States has already, by executive fiat, ended the African American Studies program at a university in Florida, going out of one's way to undermine the legitimacy of that field of study. That's all I'm saying. So. You know, I, I don't quite understand the relevance of it, but if, if your personal experience in your African-American studies class was not rigorous, then I accept that. I just wanted to put out there that many other people feel differently about their experiences. Yeah, no, there obviously was a miscommunication. Okay. What I said was it started out as a makeshift major, or it wasn't major at that point, it was called African-American studies. Um. And I said, it evolved over time into a very serious discipline. And I said, very high quality, at least of equal quality to any other discipline, has been produced by African-American studies or African-American. So, so let's get into the contrast between and I, and I, right, that and, and what, it, and what uh, Ibram X. Kendi has been talking about and the kind of lack of depth in his scholarship that you talk about in in, in your book, in a, in a lengthy chapter in your book. So for people who are not um, so familiar with his scholarship, with his book, I think he's most known for this idea of anti-racism. And he writes things like the following. He says, quote, the very heartbeat of racism is denial. When people say they're not racist, they're sharing the words that white supremacists use. Jim Crow segregationists said they weren't racist. Lynchers argued they weren't racist. The problem was the people they lynched. Slave owners said the same thing. But to be anti-racist is to say that chokehold was racist and that policy was impoverished, that community was racist. When I supported it, I was being racist, but I'm going to change it and be different. So he changes the formulation from saying we should all aspire to not be racist to aspiring to be anti-racist. And first I want to ask, do you have a like fundamental disagreement with that formulation? Or is it simply that there was not much beyond that initial sort of insight, if you want to call it that? I have never met a person who, when he or she was saying, I am not a racist, who didn't mean by that statement that they are anti-racist. Mm -hmm. The idea that when you say you're not a racist, that you were being neutral in the real world, I've never seen anything like that. When you're saying I'm not racist, you're effectively saying I'm anti-racist. So that kind of distinction struck me as completely trivial. Well, let me let me play this thought experiment with you, though. Mm -hmm. I could sit here and say, um, you know, I'm I'm not anti-Semitic. I personally, I don't even I don't even know very many Jewish people. I never even I, I'm from Colorado. I've never even met a Jewish person in my life, right? Mm -hmm. So how could you possibly call me an anti-Semite? Right. But change my circumstances a little. Ask me if I want my child to marry a Jewish person. Um, ask me if I think the president of the United States should have. Uh, she, she should be a Christian, um, things like that, then my behavior, my voting pattern, the way I advise my children could start to paint a different picture. 
And I do think that the argument that um, Kendi is making to moot it fairly is that whatever you think about the claim, I'm not a racist, that in the world we live in, we should be aspiring for something more than kind of passive non-racism, but for an approach to racism that actively is trying to push back against it, to be affirmatively anti-racist, to be affirmatively um, voting for or advocating for or pushing for or rhetorically demanding policies and interpersonal relationships that don't just ignore racism and not contribute to racism, but undo racism. If a person claims, to use your example, if a person claims to be not anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, that person doesn't want Jews to live in his or her neighborhood, then I think we have a simple word that describes that phenomenon. It's called being a hypocrite. <laughs> I don't I, I don't see any addition to knowledge or political uh, policy by making the kind of distinction that you describe. I grew up with many people who said that they were uh, not racist. Actually, most of them were admittedly racist. <laughs> I, grew, I grew up in a lower middle class Jewish neighborhood. It was very racist. Uh, that was one of the points where I wholly disagreed with Cornell West. Uh, you know, Dr. West has uh, edited two books on Black Jewish relations, mm -hmm. two full volumes. And he also, in his two books, Race Matters and Democracy Matters, in each of those books, he has a large chapter on Black Jewish relations. So he has a copious corpus on this issue of Blacks and Jews. And with all due regard to what, in my opinion, is a genuinely first-ranked mind, uh, I think very few people, myself included, uh, can appreciate, have appre fully appreciate what a dazzling mind he is. Very impressive. Uh, I think it totally, totally mystified the reality of growing up Jewish uh, in the United States and Jewish uh, values. In any event, um, so I don't uh, think it adds anything substantive <clears throat> or beyond triviality to making the claim that uh, people espouse one belief, but in practice act on another belief. But isn't that something a little different than that, though? So, for example, there are people who frequently make the argument that Okay, let's say somebody is genuinely has never affirmatively done anything racist in their lives, mm -hmm. has friends of all different hues, doesn't care who their child marries or dates or whatever, um, et cetera, but happens to like Donald Trump, say they're a fiscal conservative and is indifferent to some of the statements and policies that he advocated for and and therefore, with their vote for because of the fiscal reasons, is advancing, arguably, racist policies and ideas. Many people looked at Donald Trump that way in 2016. And as we were having all of these fights about whether it was economic anxiety or racism, said, well, OK, you might not be racist yourself, but you are at best indifferent to racism in your in in your choice to vote for Donald Trump. I do think an anti an anti-racist formulation takes into account that whatever is in your heart and, and soul, if you are not prioritizing race in a certain way and if you are not acting on that priority in any way, then you are in fact not being anti-racist. And maybe that's fine, maybe you don't care, maybe that's okay and we shouldn't ask that of people and maybe we shouldn't ask people to prioritize somebody else's racial interest over their economic interest, but whatever your moral feelings are about it, I think that there is a distinction there between somebody acting in a way that is anti-racist and somebody who is just neutral. No? Um, first of all, I, I, let's try to back up and uh, get to the heart of the issue. 
I think the heart of the issue, and here is maybe where we disagree, is I don't think this conversation gets anywhere, goes anywhere, has any substance. Why not? Okay, that's what I'm going to get to. Because the essence of Kendi's book, stamped from the beginning, is he goes around branding everybody either a racist or an anti-racist. That's the be-all and the end-all of the book. So Richard Wright, the author, he's a racist. Phyllis Wheatley, the African-American poet in the Revolutionary uh, Era, she's a racist. On what basis does he say these people are racist? Well, they're not anti-racist because Phyllis Wheatley wasn't uh, fighting enough? <laughs> because uh, in his view, there are before, can you just hold that question for one sure. minute? I want to just go through it. So Phyllis Wheatley is a racist. Richard Wright is a racist. Frederick Douglass is the worst racist. The, you're laughing, but that's the book. This is the book that won the National Book Award. The abolitionist, Charles Sumner, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, they're all racist. No, that's a fact. I'm not making this up. You see, now you're laughing, but this is what won the National Book Award. Everybody is a racist except Zora Neale Hurston, Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, and tentatively, Kendi himself. He's too modest. <laughs> no. no, that's the book. So the problem to begin with is, where do these labels get us? You just fling capriciously, promiscuously, this label, it doesn't enlighten, it doesn't contribute to knowledge. But enlighten us, Norm, Norm because I don't even know how, I can't tell how I feel about any of that. I mean, I, I suspect how I'm going to feel about it, but I need to know more about what his justification is for labeling Frederick Douglass and Phyllis Wheatley and everybody else under the sun a racist. So what what is the argument that he's making? Okay. First of all, at the risk of sounding coy, I don't believe he makes an argument. But I'll try. <laughs> okay. No, I don't. I don't. But I'll try to convey to you what he states. He says there are two kinds of racists. One is the one we all know, a segregationist who believes that groups of people are unequal in their various aptitudes and abilities and wants to separate out the races. But there's a, a segregation. Uh, and then there's a second group. And the second group is what he calls assimilationists. Those who believe that white culture is superior or those who want to become part of white culture or those who believe that black people suffer from any kind of um, uh, We'll just use the word, any kind of defects. Anybody who doesn't think, no, literally, I know it sounds like I'm being hyperbolic, but I think I devote 120 pages of my book to documenting it. Anybody who believes there is any imperfection in Black people, any imperfection in Black people is a racist. If you... But what is, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just, I don't mean to be pedantic, but what does that mean? Because every person has imperfections, but what does it mean to have imperfections as a racial group? Okay. Um, what does it mean to have imperfections as women, unless you're just saying like a chromosome itself? Mm. <laughs> I mean, many a woman has argued that the Y chromosome is an imperfection in and of itself. <laughs> but what are we really talking about here? Because I can see a way that, Anytime you are making any kind of categorical statement about a racial group like that, given the tenuous nature of what it even means to have a race, then it, I, then maybe you could have a technical argument that that is, okay. by default, a kind of stereotyping and bigotry. Okay. You know, those are absolutely fair questions. And I want to begin by saying those are serious, substantive questions. So now I'm going to try to address them, but bear in mind, and this is to me the crucial fact, 
Kendi never addresses those questions. What does it mean to say, or what is a generalization, a valid generalization? What is a stereotype? You know, or he never addresses that. Now, as you fully are aware, there's a huge body of scholarship which tries to wrestle with these questions. Mm -hmm. So a couple of weeks ago, I did an interview with Dr. Cornell West. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I asked him was, Kendi, uh, Ibram X. Kendi says that any statement you make that's a crime is a problem in the Black community or um, uh, educational achievement is a problem in the Black community. And Cornell West makes very harsh statements. Dr. West makes very harsh statements in race matters about the status and situation of the Black community. I might add, if anybody has opened, cracked the spine of any of W.E.B. Du Bois's works, he also focuses sometimes quite harshly on deficiencies in the Black community. So the first question I put to Dr. Cornell West, I said, I quoted Kennedy, who says, any generalization about Black people is racist, blah, 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 blah. And then I quoted all the statements that I called mm -hmm. from Cornell West's books, in which he says, as I said, quite harsh things about the state of the Black community, about um, crime, treatment of women. He's very tough on treatment of women, homophobia, and a thousand other things. And I asked Dr. West, do you agree with Kendi that all of these statements of yours are racist? And then he went into a long excursus on what seems to be obvious, I think, that the social sciences are impossible unless you generalize. The whole essence of the social sciences is generalizing. In race matters, you make many critical generalizations about Black people. For example, there is an incredible disregard for human, especially Black, life and property in much of Black America. The most basic issue now facing Black America is the nihilistic threat to its very existence. Moreover, Black suspicion of whites, Latinos, Jews, and Asians runs deep. You continue. There is pervasive patriarchy and homophobia in Black American life. The ugly authoritarian practices in Black America range from sexual harassment to indescribable violence against women. Again, presently, Black communities are in shambles. Black families are in decline and Black men and women are in conflict and sometimes combat. There are shattered families, including too many irresponsible, unemployed fathers. Do you agree with Kendi that these generalizations of yours should be classified as racist? Yeah, no, wait, I think I want to begin first just with context to get at what Brother Kendi's uh, claims are about. Because you see, my... Uh, my framework is just so radically different than he is. And what I mean by that is, you see, he's writing at a moment where race has been so fetishized and reified, ascribed all kinds of magical powers to it, independent of historical context, independent of economic arrangements, independent of civic arrangements, so that you end up with a discourse that is just so abstract that this it just kind of floats away even though it becomes very popular because the whole culture is obsessed with reifying race whereas for me when i talk about race i'm always beginning with the humanity of the people in fact when i had a debate with brother kindy and i told him he's, he's first and foremost are, are you first and foremost an anti-racist no not at all i'm first and foremost a lover of person, let's say begin, I'm a lover of my mama, and it leads toward anti-racist practice. That's the second step. I love 
whatever. I love the Asians. I love the Jewish folks. So I'm going to be against any kind of mistreatment of them. So anti-racism is part of a larger humanistic project that's predicated on an affirmation of the humanity of people. Because if you're anti-racist, you're really nothing but a parasite on the host. You're still looking at yourself through the lens of the racist and you're just anti them for that. And one of the distinctive features of, a, of the racist gaze is they've lost contact with the humanity of the people they're objectifying. They've lost contact with the humanity of the people they're putting down. Why would you also want to do that and only be anti-racist to their racism? You don't, you don't begin with them. You begin with the humanity of the people that you are talking about. Now, it's true in the essayistic form. And this, is, this truth goes back to Montaigne. It goes back to Emerson. It goes back to James Baldwin. It goes back to Virginia Woolf. It goes back to Edmund Wilson. It goes back to John J. Chapman. All of the great essays use language that at times looks as if it's generalizing looks as if it's homogenizing because that's part and parcel of the strategies of the essay. But if you actually look at the content and substance of the essay, you see subtlety, you see complexity, you see heterogeneity. So when I talk about family life and, and, and too much family life in black America has been devastated, that's not a generalization of all black folk. These are dominant tendencies that have taken historical form that are at work tied to market forces, tied to governmental policies and so forth and so on. See, that's a very different kind of context. And unfortunately, Brother Kendi himself, you see, I think historical sociology, Marx and Weber and Durkheim and Du Bois, and Simone de Beauvoir and others, that's absent in his work is not there. And therefore, you end up with what I'm calling this fetishizing the rich. Same is true with Brother Coach. Black, black people and black people in June generally vote Democratic. That's a generalization. But I, it feels to me like the 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 problem is never the generalization. Don't we all understand that the problem is applying a generalization to an individual, and that's what equals okay, prejudice? No, okay. okay, so. I'm quoting now Dr. West, not to use it against you, because I think he tried to reason through the question. He began quoting Max Weber and this concept of an ideal type. The ideal type never exists in reality. He called it a tendency, a tendency. And then I put to him what took to, what to my mind is the tougher question. Once we got past the right to generalize, because if you deny the right to generalize, the social sciences are over. There's no social sciences left. Um, I turn to the second question. When does a generalization, which is valid and necessary, become a stereotype, which is invidious and wrong? How do you distinguish between a valid generalization because generalization, what does it mean literally? Something that's generally true. That's a generalization. Generally, Blacks and Jews vote Democratic. That's a dem generalization. And then how do you distinguish that from a stereotype, which is by common agreement, it's invidious and it's wrong. And uh, Dr. West wrestled with that question. And I'll be the first one, the first one to acknowledge it's not an easy question. And I will be the first one to acknowledge that reasonable people can disagree on that question. Whether I gave some examples, I mean, some of them were actually quite funny. Let's say James Baldwin in um, Fire Next Time, he describes how lifeless white singers are and how dull they are. And he compares it with black uh, performers who have much more, in his view, much more soul and life. And I asked Dr. West, 
is that a stereotype? Or is it a valid generalization? I have to say his answer was actually quite surprising to me. He said, well, it is true that no white woman has been a performer on the level of Mahalia Jackson or Aretha Franklin. Had I had time to think about it, because I don't know much about music, I might have come back with Barbara Streisand, if I had the time to think about it, which I didn't. But my point is... That's what's really going to get you canceled, Norm. The sta that statement right there. <laughs> what did I say? The Barbara Streisand elf links Mahalia Jackson. <laughs> That's going to oh. be the statement that finally really ends, ends your career. <laughs> I, I have, and no. I love Barbara. <laughs> I, I happen to, I, on the contrary, happen to love Mahalia Jackson. <laughs> I, mean, I must listen twice a week to when she sings Elijah Rocks. But we'll leave that aside. <laughs> My point is very different. And I want to be clear about what I'm saying. My point is not that these are real questions. Of course, they're questions. My point is, Ibram X. Kendi adds absolutely nothing to it. He just flings labels. Everybody's a racist. Does that illuminate anything? Does that add to our knowledge? Do you think, I want to ask you a question. Do you think you're an educated person? Do you think it adds anything to our knowledge to call Frederick Douglass a racist? No. Well, I don't, first of all, I don't know because I, I still am unclear mm -hmm. as to what the rationale is for calling him that. But I do think quite, I think it's quite clear that there's something provocative about pushing people to think of themselves as having an obligation to be anti-racist instead of just not racist. And if we go back to the initial question you asked, which is why are so many people so invested in this man and his book, there are some cynical reasons. Um, I completely agree that there is a effort. You said that what, that Black people need to interrogate how we got here, but the people that you mentioned that elevate him were not Black. <laughs> the Jeffrey Goldbergs of the world. And, and I think there's a, there's a lot of white guilt that's involved in, in the elevation of people like him and Tony Nisi Coates, regardless of their own talents. And I think that Tony Nisi Coates has much more in the way of talent, um, at least as a, as a writer, than um, Kendi. But that even, even with all the cynical reasons to want to boost someone like this uh, or Robin D'Angelo and to suck the energy away from a real movement that was ongoing and self-enrichment and all of those things, even all of that aside, you still need a provocative hook to get people invested. And as much as I might have had some personal disputes with, say, Nicole Hannah-Jones and some frustrations with some of her scholarship, it's, of course, a provocative idea to reimagine history the start of American history is starting from 1619 as opposed to 1776. Of course, it's a provocative idea to ask ourselves whether we're challenging ourselves enough in the middle of a kind of racial reckoning moment, whether or not it's enough for us to just be passively not hanging people from trees or not discriminating um, against tenants or whatever the traditional modes of racism are, but to do something more affirmative, to challenge whether or not the fact that we protested the building of a housing project in our district was, in fact, a kind of racism that's untraditional enough for us not to have thought of it in those terms. And whether or not there are behaviors that we all engage in that are making the world a worse, less equal place. That's, I think that's a perfectly provocative notion. And it's not surprising to me that people would have, in good faith, been interested in hearing more about that. Brianna. There's a whole history in our country of various degrees of engagement and disengagement, overwhelmingly disengagement, but very, except for the Civil War, overwhelmingly uh, engagement or disengagement. There's a whole history uh, regarding the role of white people with regard to the rights of African Americans. Now, there's all sorts of questions about whether the engagement was sufficient, whether the engagement was marginal, how significant was the role played by the white abolitionists before the Civil War, how you evaluate Lincoln uh, as a historical figure given statements he 
made before uh, the Civil War uh, regarding uh, the equality of Black people and the desirability of them staying here should they be free. Then there is the role of whites and Jews in, in, in particular during the civil rights movement. There is a huge literature on that subject. Asking somebody, and I should say that this whole issue emerges just at the point when the George Floyd demonstrations broke out and very visibly in the first week, it was roughly 50% white, 50% black in the George Floyd demonstrations. By about the third week, it was about 80% white and 20% black um, in the demonstrations. So to say that it's a novel hook, a novel idea or a novel hook to come up with this notion that's insufficient to be um, neutral, you have to be anti. That's about as novel as the last time I fell off my dinosaur. It's just no, not. It's not. It's not about like I. It's not about so much of why people become famous. So much of, you know, there's simultaneous two groups of scientists simultaneously came up. Two scientists simultaneously came up with the theory of, of evolution. Simultaneously. Uh, came up with scientific theories all the time. It's not about, but it's it's the branding exercise. Who gets your thing published first? Who has the 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 quippiest characterization? Someone like, um, you know, the women who have come out of the Columbia River Collective, who coined terms like intersectionality as it or um, identity, identity politics. I, I've heard um, Barbara Smith say herself, it wasn't that I reinvented the wheel, but the term identity politics took, takes off. And so now here I am, the woman who invented the term identity politics. I don't think that um, Kimberly Crenshaw talking about intersectionality, you know, believes that she invented intersectionality, but they were a bunch of lesbian black women sitting around thinking about the ways that their interests weren't aligned with white feminists. And they put a label on it and it stuck. And so now they're the ones that invented the term. But they, of course, didn't invent the notion that there's tension between various identity groups and their interests that are overlapping. So, again, I, I do think there's a little bit of like, I, I would love it to be able to separate, I think, legitimate feelings about his, uh, like the, the fact that he doesn't deserve what he has achieved and that he was able to exploit a cultural moment and that a bunch of dumb, guilty white liberals heaped all this money on him. I think all of that can be true without me having to deny that there is something compelling. I don't even know that, I don't know that I said novel, maybe I did, but that there's something compelling about the way that he's come up with this term, anti-racism and really popularized that term. Okay, Brianna, I'm going to speak to you respectfully because I respect you. I don't respect everybody. You said before the show that uh, if I can quote you, you're losing your patience with people and you want to just call them an effing, effing moron. <laughs> Accurate. But there are a lot of effing morons out there, but <laughs> you happen not to be one of them. So I'm going to try to answer you uh, in the manner that you deserve. You, you, as I know, were a history of science, one of your majors as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. So you must be able as a history of science major, you must be able to distinguish between what you called a moment ago a concept and a brand. That's fine. If it's just a brand, we can cut this off short. Even if it's just a branding exercise, he succeeded in that. That's all I need to attribute to him. I honestly, like, we don't need to be on this for another 10 minutes. <laughs> or, but that's my point. He did a successful branding exercise. Why is that so hard to just acknowledge and move past? Okay, there's a simple answer to that. It's called, and maybe this is going to sound very prissy and old fashioned, it's called respect for knowledge. It's one thing to coin a brand. It's quite another if you respect a field of intellectual inquiry and you respect the vast labors that were invested in creating that field of inquiry 
to then call a brand, a concept, to heap awards, tens of millions of dollars, a center for anti-racism on somebody who just created a brand or a word. It's so disrespectful of that struggle, that struggle, the hard, honest labors, beginning, effectively beginning with W.E.B. Du Bois. The 10 hours that his biographer, David Levering Lewis, says about Du Bois, the 10 hours he put in every day at his desk trying to establish the foundations of a field all the scholars who came after him, and then to heap all this praise and vast sums of money. As somebody wrote me yesterday, um, she's from Jamaica, the country, not the part of New York. Um, she, said to me, uh, she said to me, um, I guess the money could have been better spent on scholarships. Now, $40 million in scholarships, how many young people who are struggling uh, to pay their tuition or pursue graduate studies? That's more than Biden has dedicated to all of his student debt cancellation, by the way, even though all of the dumbest shit libs on the Internet are singing uh, praises of that. That's like a dollar per student debtor. But I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> so so that, that to me is the issue. And then the second issue is this second scandal coming after the Black Lives Matter leadership scandal. It simply discredits legitimate causes and it dries up money. So all of that is true, Norm. But do you, do you think that I am making an argument that he should have gotten all of that money and that he should have had a whole whatever department that he was in charge of, that there shouldn't have, do, do you think I'm arguing in favor of all of that? Or am I making a discreet point that when you ask, why did it get so popular? I said, well, there is something there that I think is provocative for journalists and writers and scholars and people who just are tired of racism to glom onto conceptually, rhetorically, even if it is just a branding exercise. Can't, I don't I just I fully don't understand why you're conflating the idea that, yes, I can answer the question. Is there something appealing here? Obviously, quite obviously, Norm, there's something appealing. I don't know why this is a debate. If, if, if his idea were that pencils were yellow, nobody would have given him any money. <laughs> obviously, something has to be there, you know. So but that doesn't that doesn't mean you're giving him too much credit. Black Lives Matter is a branding exercise. OK. I, yes, I, we can as a branding exercise. I guess I, I don't want to, as I said, as you said, I don't want to beat a horse to death. The difference between us is very simple, in my opinion, but I could be mistaken. You use the word, obviously, there was something conceptually there. In my opinion, that is an inadequate explanation of the Kendi phenomenon. But I didn't say it was everything. Didn't I also just finish saying that there are all of these cynical reasons why all of these guilty white liberals would want to elevate him to drain legitimate energy out of a legitimate protest uh, movement? I agree with everything you said up top about him being easier to control because he's not as intellectually robust or frankly rooted in any kind of movement culture as some other people who could be in that position. I agree with all of those things. I, we're not disputing anything, which is why I think I'm a little frustrated. I, I feel like if I if I said that Kendi, at this point, if I said in this conversation, he was wearing a pretty shirt yesterday, mm -hmm. you would take that as me validating in some way all of his scholarship when I'm just giving a very discreet co compliment, or in this case, a discreet analysis of why it is that his ideas out of all of the other people out there might have had some traction, particularly at this moment, in addition to the cynical ways that 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 kernel of interest was exploited by folks like Jeffrey Goldberg. Okay. Again, I think the difference is, and maybe we should move on because you'll get exasperated. The issue is, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, 
I don't consider Kendi himself an interesting figure. Uh, I think but other the- other people clearly do though, Norm, right? So that's what we're talking about is why it is. That was the question. Why right. is he uh, that's correct. famous? Right. And I am of the opinion uh-huh. that it has nothing whatsoever to do with his so-called scholarship or his so-called concepts. Because at a moment's reflection and with a minimum amount of prior knowledge, it's very easy to demonstrate that there is nothing there. And once you've demonstrated, as I tried to do in the course of uh, 120 pages, which caused um, uh, uh, Dr. West to lament uh, several times in our interview, he said it was very (laughs) tough going reading that chapter. (laughs) Uh, I think I have, in my opinion, but others can judge for themselves, I've convinced, I've compellingly shown there's nothing there. There's no concept. There is nothing there. And then once you've demonstrated there's nothing there, the next logical question is, if there's nothing there in his scholarship, what created this phenomenon? And uh, you... As I understand it, what you tried to demonstrate was there was something there in this concept of anti-racism. I don't believe that's correct. And that's what I tried to show, of course, across 120 pages. That, first of all, on its face, on its face, describing almost all of the exemplary, exemplary figures in African-American history as racist is just bizarre. It's preposterous. It's weird. And if you can't see, and if you can't see that, then I'm not sure how one can proceed. Do you believe that virtually every figure in African-American history was a racist? Well, I definitely think there's an argument, depending on how you want to define racism, and given the limitations of us as human beings, that we're all racist. That it's almost impossible to live in a world being inundated with all of the biases that we're inundated with, that we don't internalize some of those, including against ourselves in some instances. I I totally agree with that. So if that's what he's saying and pointing to the actions, the beliefs, the words, the writings, whatever it is of various figures that are evidence of having internalized those sorts of biases. I think that's a perfectly, that's not necessarily a wrong project, even though it might not be my choice of uh, priority as a project. Okay. Martin Luther King, at one point in his life, he said, I have regretfully come to the conclusion that most white people are racist. Okay? So that confirms the point that you just made. The question then is, as an intellectual exercise, how far does that get us? If you make the claim that everyone, and I'm not going to dispute it, I'm not going to argue with you. If you make the claim that virtually, if not everyone, carries around the baggage of racism, fine. I'm not going to argue with it. I happen to think, and I've said on many occasions, I happen to think it's accurate. However, having said that, where does that get us? What kind of enlightenment does that uh, gain? It's nothing. It's just... just, mm -hmm. I have have an answer to that. Mm -hmm. I think most of us are taught a very different version of racism for most of our lives. We're taught that racism is calling someone the N-word or some other epithet or hanging them from a tree or denying them civil rights and things like that. And it's jarring to realize at a certain stage in your development that there are ways that we can be hurting other people that are much more subtle. And I think that, frankly, introducing people to those kinds of concepts and can be part of self-growth and growth as a community to trying to be better, to be aware of the ways that we might be causing harms to others that we might not otherwise have been aware of because we were fed a very simplistic version of what it meant to be good or bad as a person. So yeah, I, I definitely think there's value. I think if I were 
raising a child um, or talking to talking to someone who was y- younger than me, I would absolutely advise them to be more sensitive to those kinds of things. And in particular to people of color who I think have been fed the notion for many years that like you can't be racist, you can't hurt anybody, blah, 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 that that is destructive as a mentality in and of itself. It's not very intersectional, if you will. Um, And I also think that when you're doing work with white communities that may or may not see themselves as having an identity of interest with historically marginalized groups, being able to come to them and say, I'm not just trying to fling accusations at you or tar you as racist. We all have biases. We're all in this together, but we should be working as a community to try to see each other as human beings and not as stereotypes. Then they can feel a lot less defensive and you can do much better solidarity building work. So I think there's a lot of reasons. I, I, I find it to be a very useful tool to present myself as someone who is not immune to racism when I'm trying to talk to other people about whatever biases they may have so that we can work together. No? Is that not useful? Like, I, I'm not saying it's uh, MacArthur Genius Grant worthy, but I, 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 and I, don't, I also don't think that he invented any of that. We've been talking about that since I was in college. Right. Well, fine. Um, yeah, I mean, even even Cornell West said and I wanted to pull this quote up because I did listen to your interview or at least that section of the interview. When you asked him about anti-racism, Cornell West described it as, quote, the morally desirable position. Of course it is. We want to be anti-racist. We're just talking about how you understand it. That, that is the morally desirable position. You make the point over and over again. Anti-racism is something you're deeply committed to. That's why you got Paul Robeson looking at you every day. That's why the voice means so much. But the question becomes, how do you understand that in relation to looking at the world through the lens of poor and working people, the wretched of the earth that Fanon talked about? And that leads toward a indictment of neoliberal discourses about race and gender and sexual orientation. I think that he don't have that doesn't require an explanation. Of course is who would who would say uh racism is the morally desirable position. But of, right, but we've, we've been skipping uh, past this. Yeah. There's for him it's anti racism and racism. Oh sorry, no it's anti racism, yes, or racism. I I I would challenge that. The part of the, this that's interesting to me and that we haven't gotten to is maybe that his flaw is not allowing there to be something else. Because I, 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 you could say that being, if you only have the option of being a racist or an anti-racist, then of course being an anti-racist is the default only morally desirable position. But most of us lived in a world where we thought the op- there was an option just to be like, not a racist, as you opened with. A, a third kind of middle ground position. I thought that... Dr. West had an interesting point there. What he said, the whole problem with the anti-racism concept is it defines itself in terms of and in relationship to the racist. And he says the way, in his view, one should begin is not by starting with the racist, and the anti-racist, but to start with we all being human, and from there to define your positions. And so for him, it hadn't, you know, I'm not familiar. I have to be very clear about this. Uh, I was talking with your producer earlier before you came on, and in many of the fields where I've written, uh, I've I've been something of a novice, I'm confident in my mental capacity to see through, he called it a BS detector, and I'm confident of my capacity to detect BS, uh, but I don't claim to be an expert. So what I sat down in several occasions in my life, um, I sat down and I took iconic texts of the moment, and I examined them for their logic for their consistency, and for their evidentiary basis. And it was the same thing I did with Ibram X. Kendi, not 
knowing, you know, not even scratching the surface of the scholarship on African American history and African American culture. So um you take a term, just take a simple term. You take for granted the term racist, okay? There's a vast scholarship trying to define that term. What does it mean to be racist? What does it mean? It's not an easy concept. When you look at Du Bois, over the course of his life, he wrestled with this concept of racism. He starts out saying, well, racism is basically caused by ignorance. Uh, he was very confident, just confident, just co competently explained the situation of African Americans, examine it sociologically, and then you can eliminate racism. I know it may sound very naive nowadays, but remember, he's the first person trying to do this, and he will, he believed it was mostly ignorant. Then he says, he makes a trip to Africa and it suddenly dawns on him how critical the concept of racism was in order to justify the super profits that were being made off of the exploitation of black people. So that's the second element. Then, he starts studying the relations between blacks and whites in the American South. And he says, well, there's a third element, namely white workers benefit from locking out blacks from certain jobs. Mm -hmm. So there is a financial benefit to it. And then he says, you know, it's a curious phenomenon. White people would rather be poor so long as they have black people below them, then to equalize the condition of black workers with white workers, and they both profit. And as you know, he calls that the, the wages, the psychological wages of racism, that whites prefer one, uh, one prefer to be poor just as long as they are one notch above blacks. And then later in life, he suddenly, not I don't want to say suddenly, but it dawns on him, there is this irrational element to racism. You just can't get around it. He speaks in particular about what he calls the sex jealousy, uh, namely those hideous lynchings uh, for alleged rapists. So, and it's an interesting fact that Cornell West in Race Matters, he called it his favorite chapter, uh, was on the issue of uh, sexuality and race. And he says it's impossible to talk about race without talking about sexuality. My point being, and I admit I might be boring you, I acknowledge it. My point <laughs> Not being, at all. It's a very complicated concept. And it has a huge literature, scholarship, trying to wrestle with this term. What does racism mean? I'll tell you, when I read Du Bois, now admittedly, I don't know the field, but there were some insights of him which I had never, never occurred to me. So he says, for example, in this whole issue of uh, Black intellectual inferiority to, black, to white people, he says, it's really an impossible concept because we don't have a clear idea, he uses the word Negro, we don't have a clear idea of what a Negro is. And then it never occurred to me, when you use the IQ test, right, which is the standard claim for intellectual inferiority, how does a Black person define him or herself as a Black person? What, what standard are they using? Are they using the one drop rule when they refer to what, uh, blacks performing a uh, uh, lower performance of uh, black people to white people. Are they using the one drop rule? Are they using self-identification? Uh, these are things which, again, I don't know the field, but it had never even occurred to me that exactly when they say black IQ scores are lower than white IQ scores, 
who's defining who's black? Um, and so my point is that these are very complicated concepts. And to for me, I recoil just as you as a student of science, the history of science, would recoil at attaching the label concept to something which is just a brand like Adidas. That to me, I can't accept that. I can't accept that not because I'm some important scholar, but because I respect the intellectual labors of those who wrestle with these concepts and produce serious scholarship. As I can, as I, if I might quote Cornell West when the issue of Ibram X. Kendi came up, after his lamenting the length of my chapter and the number of footnotes, he then said that when you, at the point of my chapter, when I compared W.E.B. Du Bois with Kendi, he said, Du Bois is up here, and he raised his hand. Kendi is down there, and he shook his head, and he said, so shallow. He said, it's like comparing John Coltrane with Kenny G. And Brother Norman makes the case or both of them in that regard. I know, Brother Norman, you, you spend so much time. I mean, I, I must say, <laughs> that's a whole lot of time reading. The <laughs> then when you juxtapose the two Du Bois, you're like, oh, my God, my God. That's like Kenny G versus John Coltrane. You know, is Kenny G going to end up looking real shallow, given the dignity and the sound of Coltrane. So the, the voice is up here. And, and, and Kendi's here. And... No, I don't know who Kenny G is. I assume you do. Uh, uh, Serious, I, seriously, Norm? You know who um, Kenny G is? Smooth jazz? Uh, no, I never went the past. the hair? I never went past Mahalia Jackson. Uh, so, um, <laughs> so uh, that's the point. We're not talking about Ibram X. Kendi as a... Uh, public personality. I said to you at the beginning, and here I think you, you I, I correctly quoted myself. I said, there are two aspects to the Kendi scandal. There's the administrative aspect, and there's the academic scholarly aspect. And I said, all the focus to date so far has been on the administrative aspect, the mismanagement or worse of tens of millions of dollars. Whereas nobody is focusing on what I take to be a very significant question. How did a person of such marginal talent and publication record, how did he get catapulted to this position when there are so many talented, gifted African-American scholars who could have occupied that position. And I do not believe, because I respect their integrity, I do not believe an Adolf Reed or a Barbara Fields, if they had been given tens of millions of dollars, would have squandered it the way he did. And that goes back to how, who created him? How did he become? You think it's just because of one word, anti-racist? I know, you're going to say, I know there are a lot of other things. And I grant it. You said it, and you're right. But I do not believe that what you call this, uh, you, you called it first conceptually, and then you called it a, a, a brand, whatever you want to call it, I do not believe that has anything whatsoever as an academic credential, anything whatsoever to do with the explanation of how he got into that academic position. Incidentally, he has two positions. 
He's a professor, Andrew Mellon, professor of the humanities at Boston University, for which he gets one salary. And he's the executive director of the Anti-Racism Center, for which he gets $500,000 a year. Separate from that, he's got who, what we call in academia, not that I was ever in academia, but he has two plum positions in academia. He is the resident expert for CBS News, the resident expert on democracy now. How did that happen? I'm going to speak frankly. Amy Goodman, she went to Harvard. Her father went to Harvard. Her three siblings went to Harvard. She comes from a very impressive academic pedigree. Fool, she is not. She didn't see through him. She didn't see through Patrice Coolers. She didn't see through them. I don't believe that. She's a very smart person and a marvelous wordsmith. She loves to play word games. She didn't see through them. No, that's not possible. That is a completely bankrupt culture. That woke culture, and everybody gets in my case when I use the word, too bad. That woke culture is completely, totally bankrupt. That's the problem. That's the problem. It's not only bankrupt, but it does huge damage. I went out, I'm speaking strictly for myself, I went out every day for those George Floyd demonstrations. For six weeks, I went out every day. And then when I saw what it turned into, when I saw what it turned into, $90 million for Black Lives Matter, and it all just disappeared, you wild horses couldn't get me to go to another demonstration, and I'm pretty committed. Wild horses. And now the money is going to dry up for African American study centers. Because they're going to say, you know, those people lurking behind every black person is an Al Sharpton. That's exactly right. That's what everyone's going to think. Now you're going to say, oh, because they were racist to begin with. Yeah, I'm going to grant that. I'm going to grant that. But guess what? Why help it out? Why, why facilitate it? No, no moral, no integrity, forget it, moral, no integrity whatsoever. You have this charlatan and hustler come on your program, and then he gets that serious demeanor and mien, you know, uh, doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. You know, he's, you'll forgive me for repeating myself because I forgot what conversation preceded and what conversation can He's never debated anyone. He will never debate anyone. He'll never debate anyone. He's never responded to any of his critics. Never. That's not academia. You know, academia. I'm not singing the praises of academia. They locked me out my entire adult life. So forget me singing their praises. But it's a sine qua non of academia. And you know it from science. You have to answer your critics. You've got to answer your critics. You can't just go your merry way. But that was completely, that responsibility was completely abdicated by the woke culture with these folks. It's Can a dis- and underst- understand mm-hmm. um, just what you mean by that, because the argument as I have heard it, and do correct me if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. is that a, in, the, in the face of a genuine movement, an uprising of people disgusted by overreaches of the police state, a handful of warmongering newspaper titans like Jeffrey Goldberg cherry-picked voices of, uh, frankly, elite Blacks that were able to pacify a movement and divert it into a more innocuous form. Uh, and that ultimately the corruption of the chosen leaders has contributed to a crisis of faith and the value of various institutions and modes of discipline that are very much being capitalized on by right-wingers like 
totally uh, Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy and the entire Republican Party, who, as we speak, are trying to push through an 80 percent cut to Title I programs, which fund public education as part of the debt ceiling, um, the, the government spending debate that's ongoing right now. But I'm struggling to see when you, when you characterize it as a consequence of wokeness, it does seem to me like all the bad actors are the same institutional bad actors, the corporatists, the millionaires, the magazine titans, the right wingers paid by Coke money, all of the same bad actors who are responsible for all of the bad things that the left is always fighting against. But the character of your critique often feels like it's inveighing somewhat against the left. But correct me if I'm wrong. I don't consider so who, who is who is responsible? And you're right when you when you're talking about wokeness being the responsible for this. It seems like the people who are responsible are the same old horrible cor- corporate actors. Are we saying that they are woke, or are you pointing to a kind of weaponized identity politics, a kind of weaponized white guilt? Then are you are you calling that wokeness? Uh, perfectly fair question. First of all, I do not believe this woke phenomenon is a left phenomenon. I consider it a gangrene. I consider it a right-wing phenomenon. Number two, the what you co- absolutely correctly say, uh, the, corp- uh, the corporate sector of our country, one part of it, uh, is part of the woke phenomenon. I mean, Atlantic Magazine, New Yorker Magazine, and of course, the New York Times. These are major, major uh, components of woke culture. The New York Times now is just completely unreadable. And I remember a day it was very conservative by a leftist standard. It was, of course, called a liberal newspaper. But it was a newspaper. We, we shouldn't d- doubt that. You know, sometimes, myself included, uh, you get so influenced by Noam Chomsky that you believe that all of these newspapers are just ruling elite organs. And they are ruling elite organs. However, Professor Chomsky read the New York Times every morning. He read read eight publications every morning. And he didn't just read them in order to expose their prejudices or their ideology. He also read it for information. Now the Times, you know, you, you might as well read a State Department press handout on Ukraine. It's unreadable. It's unreadable. Uh, but these are powerful organs. Nobody's going to dispute the power of the New York Times, not what it was in my day, but still very powerful. They're completely woke. They're completely woke. So when I say woke, the woke culture is responsible for it. Of course, I'm including the giant media outlets and all the other, you know, the Jeff Bezoses, the Jack Dorseys, they're all woke. But this is and, so confusing, okay, though. Okay, wait. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm going to, I'll just, uh, um, uh, one last thing. The difference between the right and the woke sector, I'm not talking about the left, the right and the woke, the woke sector created these figures and is totally uncritical. You know, the story didn't break into the times until well after the right wing, you know, when the whole thing started with the firings of the uh, 15 to 20 people at the center. Uh, there were a large number of right wing articles. That's when I wrote you. And I said, you want to you know, do a story? And then the times finally came along and wrote something about it. They do everything they can to suppress mm-hmm. sort of stuff. And then it's just handing to the right wing, like on a silver platter. It makes them, it makes, I'm not saying. Yeah, I, I, I just, I want to, I thought we're running out of time though. And I just really want to get to the core of this if I can. I, I understand what you're saying. I don't understand the utility of using the word woke to describe, uh, frankly, anti-black, anti-poor, corporatists who run all these institutions that are geared toward derailing meaningful social movements. Why the choice to use the word woke, which we all know is a word that I think was rooted in the left, a legitimate discuss- a word that was supposed to evoke people understanding the systems in the world that we're talking about that are so destructive to the interests of poor and working people. 
It has been co-opted by the right to mean something about um, liberal overreach and pink haired girls from Oberlin proclaiming their pronouns. And so I'm just, if, if what we're describing here is the exact same kind of systemic issues that are used or systemic tools to suppress social movements that have always existed and that have always been rooted in right wing neoliberal efforts, then what is the utility? What is the word? How is the word woke serving you in this instance? Because the backlash you're getting is not to the, su the substance of what you're describing. I think everyone agrees with everything here. What, the who, the where, the what, the why, all of that. But the bristling is that this idea that somehow wokeness, which now just means liberalism or the left or people who like gay people or people who like drag shows or whatever, Disney characters, <laughs> like what, 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 how, how are you using the word woke? What is it meaning to you in this context? And are you basically advancing the right's efforts by characterizing what is a right wing problem, whether it's a right winger like Jeffrey Goldberg or a right winger like uh, A.O. Scott or a right winger like Ron DeSantis as something that's woke? Um, we did an interview in live in Washington a few months ago, and you asked me the question has been attached to your name. What do you mean by woke? And mm -hmm. I'm not going to retread that ground now. For those who are curious, they can listen to the interview, which is posted on the web. What I would say is there is a phenomenon out there. It's not something that's conjured by the right wing. And I tried when we had the conversation to delineate as best as I could what I understand to be that phenomenon. And I think it's perfectly legitimate because I'll be honest with you, I like the term because it's a mocking term. And I know that might sound unserious, but again, I'll be candid with you. I think it's completely warranted to mock a completely preposterous, ridiculous phenomenon of which Ibram X. Kendi is one example. Just as in my day, we had that term PC, political correctness, that was also a mocking term. It was also, by the way, coined by the left. We were mo mocking our semi-ridiculousness, but the difference was, there's a huge difference, PC, was a very marginal phenomenon. It was mostly academics, ex-new leftists, who went into teaching. It was a very marginal phenomenon. This is not marginal. Candy got $50 million. You know how people die for that kind of money when they're trying to do academic research? This is a corporate-sponsored, corporate invested phenomenon, which has many you know, roots, which in our conversation, I, I, I try to delineate as best as I understand it. But there's something real out there. And I, in my opinion, it does huge damage. Even today, and we'll maybe, I understand you're short on time. I take a walk or go jogging on the boardwalk at Coney Island every day. And I met a Russian fellow today, uh, and I just got to talking to him. Obviously, we talked about the Ukraine and so forth. And then we got to talking about school. And he said he's a, he was a, or he, oh, during COVID, he took a City University, CUNY, City University of New York course. And he's interested in literature. And he says, I took this course in literature. And the professor, all he went on about is, this character is homophobic. That character is anti-feminist. And he said, it was just so boring and it's just propaganda. He, he dropped the course. Now, if you ask me what's causing now the disintegration of the humanities uh, or the social sciences, as it's sometimes called, 
Of course. The first cause is the economy. Young people cannot experiment as they did in my day. You take an anthropology course here, you take a sociology course there, you take a women's studies course here, an African-American studies course. They don't have the money to experiment. And every one of their courses has to be connected with the job. They need a job when they get out. In my day, we didn't need a job because we knew when we got out, there would be a job. So that's the first factor, the economy. Second, student debt. Obviously, you're not going to spend money on courses if it's going to accumulate a debt. But the third factor, and we can, in my opinion, we can't be blind to it, is these woke freaks are destroying whole departments. They are. I see it over and over again with students who just are sick and tired of this lecturing about how they're suffering from this phobia or that ism or this, this ism. Instead of teaching, it's become a horror story when the right wing says that it's true. I'll just end with one anecdote. When I wrote the book, uh, uh, all my friends hated it, my age cohort. It was very painful. I count sometimes I lost, I don't have a large number of friends. I don't. I lost 10 people over that book, including two of my former publishers. And I turned to Professor Chomsky and I asked him, because Chomsky has always in public minimize the detrimental impact of this woke culture in public. He's minimized it. I wrote him a letter and I said, look, I'm very conflicted about this. And I asked him, should I publish the book? And he wrote back to me. He said, uh, if you have any doubts, about publishing the book. And then he wrote, don't. And my heart sank because I thought he was saying, don't publish the book. And then the next sentence read, of course, publish it. It needs to be said by a person on the left. Of course, it's been said by a 100 people on the right. It needs to be said, this culture is not just back, uh, bankrupt, it's retrograde and it does real damage. And in my opinion, Ibram X. Kendi, about whom I honestly, I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less. He's an exemplar of the damage. Reduce the field to idiotic brands discredited the giving of money and donations and nurturing a field. And for those who already harbor those racial prejudices, which I agree, as a white male, I fully agree, we all carry around those prejudices, just as I'm sure you do about Jews. <laughs> um, I fully agree. However, I don't see any point in handing to the right wing these victories on a silver platter, making it so much easier for I, them. I really, I really do understand, Norm, but I just so so what? If the if the if it's all because Kindy, who was one of many useful idiots out in the world, mm -hmm. was chosen, you know, he's a human being. If someone gives him a million dollars, he's gonna take a million dollars. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 via your own argument, he wouldn't exist if he hadn't been chosen, if codes hadn't been chosen. I don't mean to lump them together because I don't think that's fair to codes, but by whom? If my only my only pushback, and we really got to wrap now, but my only pushback is that this feels like an invective against, I'm not sure exactly who, but it doesn't seem very targeted at, you're saying the left needs to say it? Well, the left spend, does nothing but criticize the exact systems and power that made this happen. And those powers are not on the left. So it does, you're, you're saying that it hands, 
it hands up all of these departments and it hands up all of this uh, um, space in the humanities on a platter to be decimated by the right. I, I think that in some way you saying that is doing that. The right has been out to kill public education, to kill the liberal thought that happens organically in college since the Reagan era. The right has been choosing useful idiots to be the mouthpieces of black people, whether it's in the media or in Congress, since we were given the right, a, 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 we fought and earned and, and, and died for the right to vote. So I, I don't know. It does feel like a, l- a little bit of a misplacement of where the responsibility lies. And I think there could be a little, a little bit more clarity about who is responsible and who we're mad at. Kindy mm. is a, is a, you know, a largely useless, but also inconsequential person in the grand scheme of this. Yeah. But I, I just I'm not I'm not seeing the directionality of this critique really, really targeting the people who are responsible now, yesterday, and tomorrow for creating more kindies that have the effect of neutering movements that we very much need in this country. I think there has been an abdication of responsibility from people who call themselves on the left either from fear or because of wanting to curry favor. But no one on the left liked Ibram X. Kendi. There's not a single leftist in America who ever said a positive word about Ibram X. Kendi. It was all liberals. And maybe Amy Goodman. I don't know. I don't know her life. Okay. But- you you would, um, first of all, I agree with you that it was all these woke liberals. On that part, I agree with you. However, it's important to distinguish those woke liberals from an authentic left. Number two, I think you would be very hard pressed. You can do it afterwards and show me I'm wrong. Uh, finding people on the left who've on the left who've criticized Kendi. I spoke to people. No, they're they're all out worried about the UAW strike or what the terms of the the Writers Guild agreement, the tentative agreement are. We just don't care about this guy. We never read his book. We didn't care. Yeah, well, that's that to me uh, is an evasion. I I have to say, and then it's unworthy of you, but you are a lawyer by training, so uh, I can <laughs> understand the evasion. Obviously, as everybody tells me. You cannot walk into a bookstore nowadays without his book being on the front shelf. It's impossible. I, everyone tells me that. I don't go into bookstores, uh, but it's always right out there. It's everywhere. And then to tell me we don't care about it, we care about the UAW strike, that strikes to me, strikes me as an invention. Ideology, academia, but, but idea- no. No, you're you're doing exactly what the Democrat and Republican Party not not you're doing it, but like this is exactly what the Republican and Democratic Party wants to do. The Democratic Party creates Ibram X Kendi's. Mm-hmm. It creates issues that we're supposed to care about. Oh, like we're we're gonna fight. You know, and I don't say these aren't important issues, by the way. But like it says, the battle the Democratic Party is gonna have is gay marriage, giving us Juneteenth, and whatever the heck else. And the Republicans go well. The issue that you should care about is. Uh, trans people dancing in front of your kids, uh, someone telling you your kid is racist in the fourth grade, uh, and Venezuelans taking your jobs. And then we all fight about this shit. And I'm supposed to be mad about Ibram X. Kendi? I don't care. I care about the fact that people who, a, a lot of whom probably voted for Donald Trump, are locked arms and arms together on a picket line in Detroit, Michigan, with enough power to have forced the schmuck of a president that we have to join him and articulate that he agrees with them that they should have a 40% pay raise. And I think it's God bless the left that is focused on that right now instead of um, having an argument, you know, our argument about whether or not we should end the humanities because Abram X. Kennedy uh, looks to be a charlatan. You know, Uh, do you ever feel, are you ever concerned that maybe like you're like, this is, this is what they want us to be doing. I think it's, um, well, there are two, two aspects. First of all, it's already done. There is a woke culture out there, which in my opinion, as I said, it's bankrupt and it does real harm. And number two, 
you wouldn't have done the show if you thought Kenny was a complete irrelevance, either as a person or as a phenomenon. Well, no, because I think that the point of what damage people like this can do, understanding what the Democratic Party and what the neoliberals and, frankly, right-wing Democratic Party does to derail movements and how they are able to effectively do so, is worth studying. That is worth keeping a track of and keeping your eyes open the next time there's a legitimate movement swell, like back Black Lives Matter, not to let it get co-opted. I mean, the writing's on the wall. Who knows what they're going to do with this union stuff? Frankly, there's a part of me that it is very nervous that Joe Biden went. Because what does it mean that Joe Biden is there? There must be some plot afoot to make sure that he's not seriously entangled in being beholden to the interest of striking workers. At that point, I'm not clear, and you'd have to repeat it for me. The point is that they're so good at co-opting movements that I'm also concerned about their ability to do so with the workers that are striking all across the country right now. And that the fact that Joe Biden has joined the picket line is actually worrisome to me on some level because I'm concerned that they would not have put him in the position of seeming so in line and solidaristic with the workers unless they had a plan for him to undermine it ultimately at the end of the day or at least, or at least extract himself. I, that's just my cynical right, well, um, fears. That, that, that's sort of like uh, as old as the hills. You had, right. you had on your show, you interviewed uh, Dr. West's new campaign manager. Yes. And there was a point in the program where I appreciate his candor, although I wasn't at all surprised. Still, there was a certain amount of honesty there. He says, you know, imagine you're a 20 year old and suddenly you're surrounded by all these important people and they're asking for your advice and there's, they're telephoning you. And he said it was very intoxicating and it's very, very hard to resist. And it was perfectly obvious. That's also what happened to AOC. You know, she gets catapulted from Astoria, Queens to going shopping with Nancy Pelosi. It's that goes to your head. I get that. So the fact that what you describe, of course, there's a very real possibility that uh, even he seems like a decent guy, the head of the UAW, but even he can be co-opted. Uh, and that's an, there I agree that there's an important lesson there. And the lesson is, it's not guaranteed, but when you support a candidate, you look for the candidate's track record. You look for yeah. the candidate's sacrifice. You look for the candidate's length of commitment to the cause. And when, in the case of Kendi, there was no track record. There wasn't an academic track record. There wasn't a political track record. So it's so, so, so easy mm -hmm. to buy them off. And I'll end with a word of criticism of you, though reasonable people can disagree. I'm just going to say my opinion. Uh, don't get nervous. I'm not going to say, you know, something. No, I'm just a little concerned about time, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, you keep speaking of Marion Williamson as a significant candidate, a candidate who maybe you would support and so on and so forth, because she's taken these positions, quote unquote. And to me, with all due respect, it's kind of laughable. Marion Williamson has no record in politics. I, I'm sorry, Norma. I really can't. I I, I cannot. I, I'm just telling you, honestly, I don't have the time to sit here and defend Marion Williamson. And so I cannot let her be. No, I cannot I, let you say a bunch of statements that I, I'm likely going to no, want to push I, back against. We really do have to wrap. I'm sorry. Right, I'm just, yeah, you can cut it. You know, just leave that part out. I'm just saying that there's no guarantee but when you look to a candidate, at least part of the left tradition, a candidate on the left had to have proven him or herself. With I, a I think that's fine. Norm, it's, it's irrelevant. It, she's not going to win the primary. Uh, so if no. you don't want to vote in the Democratic primary, uh, you don't have to. I'm going to use my vote to vote for Marianne Williamson. I don't really understand why we're still talking about this on the left. I find it to be exasperating. Please mm. don't vote for Marianne. I, I promise you, I don't care if you vote for Marianne. I don't care if anybody else votes for Marianne. I have a vote. I am living in D.C. I would rather use it to vote against Joe Biden. I'm not voting for RF Kennedy, so I'm going to vote for Marianne. And to me, that's like logically obvious. And 
but I'm not trying to persuade anybody of anything. But I don't know why everyone wants to talk me out of voting for Marianne. So God bless. Everybody do what you're going to do. I am going to do strategically what I think is useful, which is to register my discontent with the Democratic Party in the primary by voting for Marianne Williamson and then voting for our um, Cornell West in the general election. This seems to be the, the most obvious, least controversial statement in the history of left politics. But apparently I've stepped on a third rail. But we, we really do have to go, Norm. But uh, I, I really do appreciate you joining me today, Norm. For people who want to hear more, please do check out I'll Burn That Bridge When I Get To It. Heretical Thoughts and Identity Politics, Cancel Culture, and Academic Freedom. You can find it wherever books are sold. And Norm, do we want to tell people where to find you or more of your work on the internet? No. Okay. All right. Okay. You you probably already follow him on, on the internet, et cetera, on Twitter, X, whatever we're calling it. Uh, take care of yourselves as always and keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.